Joshua set up at Gilgal where those 12 stones they had taken from the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future your children will ask their parents, what about these stones? Then you will tell your children, Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thank you, Samara. Thank you. Well, Friday was Cinco de Mayo, the 5th of May and stuff. And the youth group walked over to the, uh, the new building that's going to be the Community Health uh, Partners, uh, where they had kind of a, a vendor fair. Um, you know, the Cinco de Mayo com- com- commemorates the anniversary of when Mexico's army, led by General Ignacio Zaragoza, had his victory over the Second French Empire, you know, and their army was being led by Napoleon Bonaparte. And at the Battle of Pueblo in 1862. But at the vendor fair, it was put on by the Illinois Valley Hispanic Partnership Council, and it celebrated Mexican-American culture through authentic Mexican food, They had traditional folk dances, the decorous dancers with their traditional dresses and and dress, and they they were very colorful. They were made up of boys and girls and men and women of all ages. You know, I've been taking the last few weeks a Spanish class online, and it gave me a little bit of an opportunity to see if I could pick up a word or two. But it was a joy to see the tradition, the heritage, and the culture of the Hispanic community. Another thing is, you know, when I first came to Zion, I walked into the sanctuary and I noticed the icons up on the wall. And I kind of, I didn't know uh, iconology is what they're, uh, the, uh, uh, the field that they're called. But I looked up there, and I noticed there was a windmill. And I said, oh, there's windmills. You come down 39, there's windmills. So I just thought it was kind of, you know, prolific that they, you had a windmill up on, um, up on the wall. But someone a few weeks ago lay, put this, these papers on my desk, and what it did is it kind of went through what each of those symbols represents. Does anybody know what they represent? that hasn't read the newsletter? It's in the newsletter. Each of those icons represents one of the original disciples. And there's 11 of them. Of course, Judas had left, so he doesn't get an icon. Uh, There is a 12th icon of Matthias, who the apostles elected to take Judas's place, but that's not represented up there. But back there, I've got copies of the newsletter if anybody wants to take a look and find uh, the disp- their, disp- uh, their, apost- or their disciple um, up there. Um, but it, I think it's amazing that it's a visual representation as I think icons transcends the language barrier and, uh, of, and what they represent. But that's part of our tradition. You know, and the beauty of of traditions, you know, I talk to the kids, it's like a, a, a mental reminder of the way it was or a particular event in history. But today in the church, we often hear much talk about tradition and heritage without getting the ire up with one another. In fact, many churches, in church circles, tradition is almost used in a negative sense. It is used to describe the old, the dead ways, even it stifles growth. A lifeless past that has no potential from which uh, the modern world can escape and experience God. I mean, the church has experienced worship wars. You know, the traditional service and the contemporary service where it has different styles of music, even different styles of preaching. 
but tradition. But how do we as Christians respond to this changing world? How do we balance our experience of the past with a world that didn't exist even five years ago? And how do we teach our children what is important when so much of the world is rapidly changing? You know, the Jews have always understood the importance and the power of tradition. They were steeped in tradition. And even the early Christians understood that tradition also. And maybe our answers do not lie here in the presence. I mean, there are many passages in the Bible that deal with these questions of our tradition. What we need to remember, and sometimes what we need to remember so it doesn't happen again. You know, Samara read that scripture from Joshua, the fourth chapter, and it's about Joshua and the Israelites crossing the Jordan. It says Joshua set up at Gilgal those 12 stones and they had taken from the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask your parents, what about these stones? And then you will let your children know Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. So generations later, when they saw the stones, they were reminded of that crossing of the Jordan. See, the story of Joshua is of the Israelites who had been enslaved in Egypt by Pharaoh in several hundred years. And when the oppression got so unbearable, they cried out to God for deliverance. And God heard their cries. God had raised up Moses and had empowered him to deliver the Israelites from the bondage of Pharaoh. And the conflict was set. Moses and Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, against Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods. But it was really no contest. See, God brought the plagues and the death of the Egyptians firstborn. God parted the waters of the Sea of Reeds and allowed the Israelites to escape. God even protected the fleeing slaves with a cloud of fire. And repeatedly, Moses told Pharaoh and the people that God was doing those great and wondrous things so that they might know that he was God. And the Israelites believed in God and his servant Moses. So now after 40 long years of struggle in the desert, their descendants were crossing the Jordan to enter the land. Joshua was their leader and they were finally going home. You know, the, the passage is of the crossing uh, of the, that was led by Joshua you know, the people had already sent out spies and are assured by God that they will be able to enter the land safely. The Jordan River was all that laid in between them and the land of Canaan. And normally, the Jordan was a small river that could be easily crossed, about as wide as the drainage ditch out here, believe it or not. But however, during the spring and the melting snows of the, the mountains, it turned that river into a torrent. It spread out over the floodplain, and it could have been much as a mile wide. And Joshua assured the people that God was about to do something wonderful so that they might know that he was their God and he was with them. See, as the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant into the flooded river, the water stopped flowing. The people crossed easily. After that, they had crossed. The river again began to flow. God had again entered history and had brought a wonderful deliverance for his people. But if a story is to have meaning for us today, we need to slow down and hear how Joshua tells the story. See, the crossing of the river is the central event. But throughout the story, there is an added dimension that catches our attention. 
Stones. Stones are an important part of this story. The people take stones from the river and they place, uh, they place them uh, piled up in a heap. And the end of the story is not the crossing of the river, but the pile of stones they raise and their significance. See, the story itself tells us the purpose of that heap of stones. They are to be a memorial of this event. And when those who come later, those who have not experienced the great revelation of God, see the stones and they ask them, then the story of God's great act for the people is to be recounted. And the story is to be told for a specific reason. It's not to be just a story about national origins and and something told to entertain the kids. They are to tell the story so that the people might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always have reverence to the Lord your God. And later generations need to know who God is and what he can do. And sometimes even the ones who have witnessed God's actions need to remember. Here's where something, sometimes we struggle to understand the story. If we're not careful, these events might simply be a, remo- a memorial to a long past event that really has little meaning for us beyond saying, yeah, that was a really cool story, how God did that. And the stones become simply another cold, lifeless monument of the past. But what was so important about these piles of stones for the Israelites, and why was it so important that these people retell the story and know its meaning? You see, these Israelites who have been standing on the banks of the Jordan after a great miracle will experience times when they will not be able to see by their present experience the God is God at all. There will be times when they will not be sure if God is present among them. There will be times of defeat, of discouragement, of despair, There will be times where there will be no miracles. And there will be times when their world is thrown into such chaos that they will not be able to see the future at all. It is those times, perhaps most of all, that they will need to look back and know that the hand of God is powerful. In those times, they will need a reference point. They will... They cannot prove God's presence by their own experience when they do not know how to adapt to the changing world. They will need to be able to look back and know from past encounters that God is God. And they will need an anchor point. They will need to be able to look at that pile of stones by the Jordan River and say, we're not sure right now of God's presence but we know for certain that God is God because this pile of stones bears witness to him. Last week, I was on a civil civil rights pilgrimage which took me to many of the sites of the civil rights struggle during the 60s. Uh, Saturday, I was in Selma, Selma, Alabama. And it's the site of the Selma to Montgomery marches And there were three marches held in 1965 along a a 54-mile stretch of highway from Selma, Alabama to the state capitol in Montgomery. The marches were organized by a nonviolent activist to demonstrate the desire for African-American citizens to exercise their constitutional right to vote. And in defiance of the segregationist or segregationalist repression, they were part of a broader voting rights movement underway in Selma and throughout the American South. The first march took place on March 7, 1965. Thousands gathered along, and news media from all over the country 
Assembled in front of Brown's Chapel AME Church on the other side, the north side of the Alabama River in Selma. Mark, if you could put, that's a picture of the Brown's Chapel. And uh, also uh, uh, the, the bust of uh, Martin Luther King. And as I said, a thousand marchers assembled on the north end of town. Probably put up the next picture. This is a picture of the crowd on the first march. People assembled from all over the country in front of Brown's Chapel. And if you could see, there's news trucks. There's ABCs there. So they had news coverage. They marched from the south end of the Edmund Pettus Bridge to cross. And as they approached, after they crossed the bridge and approached the first intersection after crossing, County Sheriff Jim Clark had or commanded a posse of 200 deputies, some who, of which were in the KKK or the National States Rights Party. They were armed with electric cattle prods, some were mounted on horseback and carried long leather whips and used la to lash the people on, on, on foot. And they carried these long wooden batons the size of baseball bats. And as the marchers stood face to face with the deputies, tear gas cylinders were employed and the posse attacked the peaceful protesters. This is what's called Bloody Sunday. Several were injured. In fact, I, a couple were, uh, lost their lives that day. The marchers that could turned around and fled back across the bridge where they thought it was safe. But the city's fire department had turned their hoses on the fleeing crowd. All this was broadcasted live, or I think on a delay at that time, was broadcasted to a national audience around the country. Two days later, on March 9th, Martin Luther King, along with clergy of many different denominations, were represented with those marchers for their second attempt. But this time, when the marchers stepped aside and let them pass, King led the marchers back to the church because he was obeying a federal injunction while seeking protection from a federal court for the march. That night, a, a white group beat and murdered a civil rights activist, James Reeb, a white Unitarian minister from Boston who was, had come to Selma to march. And soon the federal courts ruled to allow the peaceful march from Selma to Montgomery, that 54-mile stretch of road. President Johnson federalized the Alabama National Guard to protect the marchers. And on March 21st, they set out and marched a third time. It took them five days to march, stopping about every 10 miles to camp for the night. And we visited a couple of those campsites. And they arrived in Montgomery, Alabama, the state capital, on March 24th. But it was this highlighting of the racial injustice they contributed to the passage that year on August 9, 1965, the Voting Rights Act, a landmark federal achievement for the civil rights movement. Mark, if you could have put up the next picture. This is a picture of me crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And then the next picture. At the foot of the bridge, there's these stones, 12 of them. 12 stones. I mean, there were 12 stones at Gilgal. One stone placed by each of the tribes of Israel and stones here placed at the end of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. For you see, those stones aren't 
not just stones. They're far more than a pile of rocks on a bank of a river. Those stones are a heritage, a remembrance, a tradition. A tradition that balances the past that's known and a future that's not so clear sometimes. They are a way to recall who the people are, who God is, and therefore what they should do and be as God's people. The stones have become a beacon that shines far beyond the banks of the Jordan or the Alabama River, far beyond the time of Joshua or those marchers in Selma. They tell more than a parting of waters or even a crossing of of a bridge. They are stones of a reminder. Part of the responsibility of a community are to be sure that the future generations know the story and the meaning of the stones for just such occasions. That pile of stones was to be that anchor point, a point of reference for a later time when the path would not be so clear. They're like a signpost from the past to the future. They are a marker by which they can stand in their present, look to the past, and then draw a straight line into the unknown future. They are a way to define the present and the future by the means of the past. See, they cannot know where to go until they know where they are. And they cannot know where they are until they know where they have been. So do you see the significance of the pile of stones in Joshua? They are the anchor point. They tell the people where they have been. They tell them who God is. And they tell them what God can do. These stones allow them to draw that straight line from the past, the past acts of God, into their uncertain present and beyond. See, in Joshua, they told us their story. And when their children have asked, what do these stones mean? They have said, I met God here. And I know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And I know, and I want you to know so that you might always have reverence to the Lord your God. And so before we we know firsthand for ourselves, we saw the piles of stones and we learned the lessons of the heritage and their tradition. Not the stale traditions of facts and rituals, but a tradition of living encounters with God the heritage of living stones that speak to us of God and his work in the lives of his people. So we can look at our piles of stones and draw that line from them to where we are so we can understand how we got here and we can understand who we are and what we must do. See, our task is to take that line drawn through those piles of stones into the past and extend it into the future that we do not know. But it is a future that we can face because we have a reference point, a stability, a a faith that even though we cannot see the end of the journey, we know how, where we are headed because we can see the pile of stones stretching beyond at plotting our course. This is what it means to have faith, to journey into the future backwards. That is the only way we can know where we are going. So I don't think it's any accident that Jesus sat with his 12 disciples and commemorated a crossing of the Red Sea at Passover, that he drew the line again. 
Jesus asked his disciples to remember the new action of God in history that was unfolding before their eyes. And as Jesus took the bread and passed the cup, he asked them to remember him through the ceremony because he was building a new pile of stones. And our task is also to leave those piles of stones for our children and to others so that they may ask what those stones mean. And we will tell them the story so that they may know God is God. And so also guide them into an uncertain world. So brothers and sisters, we gather at this table. We gather at this table, the Lord's table, where all are invited, who earnestly repent of their sins as we say, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. And you delivered us from captivity. You made a covenant to be our sovereign God and you spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord. Power and might. Heaven on earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. Your spirit appointed him to preach the good news to the poor. To proclaim and release the captives. To recover the sight up to the blind. To set at liberty those who have been oppressed. And to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. And he ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. And you made with us a new covenant by water and of spirit. And when the Lord Jesus ascended... He promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke that bread. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, here, take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and he said, here, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Now pour out your Holy Spirit on all that are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood, by your spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son Jesus Christ with your holy church and your holy spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Today we will be offering communion both ways through intinction. Uh, I'll be holding the bread. I'll give you a piece of bread. Um, also be holding the cup. You'll dip your bread in the cup and then consume it. Uh, Alyssa is going to help out if anyone would prefer to have uh, the elements um, uh, in the cups. 
um, she'll be holding those. So I say to you, let's all prepare ourselves to uh, come to the table. As the bread is broken, and remember it's a, uh, Jesus' body which is broken for all of us. And the cup, the cup, the blood of salvation, the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Um, if Alta and Alyssa would like to come forward, I don't know if you want to And we can step down there. Yeah, we'll step down there. Let's see if you want to hold that cup. The table is ready. Um, and I think uh, Bev's going to play some music as we all come forward. I'll see you in the middle. This will work. This will work. This will work. Steve, the bread of uh, life broken for you. Cherry Lynn, the bread of life broken for you. Bev, the bread of life broken for you. Karen, the bread of life broken for you. William, the bread of life broken for you. Ben, the bread of life broken for you. Nancy, the bread of life broken for you. Dan, the bread of life broken for you. John, the bread of life broken for you. Okay. Ken, the bread of life broken for you. Seraphina, the bread of life broken for you. Lysandra, the bread of life broken for you. Kayla, the bread of life broken for you. Benoni, the bread of life broken for you. Oops. Samara, the bread of life broken for you. Randy, the bread of life broken for you. Kenny, the bread of life broken for you. Courtney, the bread of life broken for you. Beth, the bread of life broken for you. Gary, the bread of life broken for you. Mark, the bread of life broken for you. Um, and you've got a cup for her. She's got a cup for her. Um, I'll do it this way. Alta, the bread of life broken for you. The blood of new covenant shed for you. The bread of life broken for you. Um, did you want this or bread? Alyssa, the bread of life broken for you.